say thank you. Because they did their job to perfection to usher us into the presence of God. Amen. There's one little thing before we go into the message is there is a little phrase that Wendy said there and she said, I want to be the alpha in your life. Like God is saying, I want to be the alpha in your life. And I know what she meant. She meant the alpha and the omega. And she even said that later. I want to be the omega in your life. But instantly, do we know anything about animals or dogs? Yeah, there's always an alpha, isn't there? And guess what? There can only be one. It doesn't matter how big your pack is. There can only be one alpha. And it better be God in your life. Amen. All right. So last week, if you remember, we looked into being reclaimed and restored and repurposed for the kingdom of God. And by looking at examples like a piece of wood and a business and a building, we saw how the process of being reclaimed and repurposed can also happen in our own lives. And... It can happen through the restorative work of the cross and the repurposing power that is Holy Spirit, right? And so we're going to follow along that same vein, okay, of reclaimed and restored and repurposed as we go into the message tonight, which is titled, Rescued, Ransomed, and Redeemed. And so it's true of myself, and it's my prayer for each of you as well, that those three words can be used to describe our own lives. That we, in fact, have each been rescued and ransomed and redeemed. But if it's not yet true for you, I pray that you don't walk out of these doors tonight without being able to relate to all three of those words in a very, very strong and intimate manner. Rescued out of a lifestyle that once had us bound ransomed from the enemy that held us captive and redeemed to a life abundant in Jesus Christ. Amen. So as we begin to go into each of these this evening, I just want to say, first of all, how much I absolutely love the way that God orchestrates things. And I'll say it all the time because I never get sick of it. But not just how he'll orchestrate like a word fitly spoken for the ones that he knows that are going to be here, but also how he does it so often in praise and worship. And the fact that the songs that we sang tonight were chain breaker and break every chain and sea of victory. There were probably no better songs that I could have picked if I had picked the list for tonight, which I did not. I think there's only been one time ever that I requested a song because it so went along with a message. I always say, I'll just let God do that. He does a way better job than I can. And it was the case as well for tonight. And it's just so good, you know. Um, But we're going to go into the first of our three segments. And it's under the title or the heading rescued. And so we see in Paul's second letter to Timothy, um, as he's writing of a time when he himself was rescued. It's found in 2 Timothy chapter 4. We're going to read verse 17 and 18. He says, But the Lord stood at my side and gave me strength, so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed, and all the Gentiles might hear it. And I was delivered from the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue me. Everybody say that with me. The Lord will rescue me. From every evil attack and will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now there are three key words that he lists there. He uses the word strength. He uses the word rescue, which is what we're on, right? Rescued. And he uses the word safely, or another translation says safety. Okay? And while we could read them as just like blindly rejoice at these verses that, yeah, we're always held safe in the master's arms, okay? Yeah, there's a truth to that, but guess what? We cannot be naive enough to think that that means that we're never going to face trial or that we're never going to see heartache in our lives. And we have to watch, just as Wendy said, as we go out and proclaim to those who are around us in our workplace and in our lives, we have to make sure that we don't give some kind of false promise, 
You really need to come to church. You really need to, to worship the God that I worship. Everything's going to be great. He'll fix everything in your life. He'll make it all perfect. No, he won't. He could if that's what was best for you, but I can guarantee that's not what's best for you is for all your troubles to go away and for life to just be grand from here on out with no complaints. I can guarantee you, you will not become a stronger, deeper, more healthy Christian if he did that. Okay, so we can't be naive enough to think that everything's always going to be perfect or sunshine and roses, and we can't promise that to anyone else either because guess what happens? Yeah, sign me up. That's great. I'll come. Sure, I'll try Jesus. Yeah, and then the first bump in the road comes, and they're giving up going, well, that just must not be for me. Mm -hmm. Well, no, that just wasn't the truth of the gospel that you were taught or that you were promised. And so we can't be under the false assumption that will joyously float from our birth in Christ all the way to our life in eternity. Jesus tells us in John 16, 33, what? In this world, you will have trouble, but be of good cheer because I've overcome the world, right? And so if we think to those three key words that Paul used there in that scripture, I can't stand still tonight. I'm like all over the place. <laughs> Strength and rescue and safety, then we must realize that you only need to be strengthened when you're in a weakened condition. Think of that. And you only need to be rescued when your well-being is out of your own hands. And you only need to be kept in safety when there is violence or risk of harm all around you. So think of that. And in this world, we'll see heartache. And in this world, we're going to experience pain. And we're going to have trouble. After all, the scripture tells us it rains on the just and the unjust. But... We have also been given the truthfully encouraging words of Paul that God will strengthen us and rescue us and bring us to a place of safety. Hallelujah. And how many of us have ever needed rescued in our lives before? Yeah. Yeah, amen. <laughs> What Paul is writing to Timothy of there is God bringing him through a time when he was being brought to trial for preaching the gospel, okay? But our need for rescue may be in all sorts of different things, right? And David speaks often of needing rescued from the enemies of the Israelites, right? Literal enemy armies which sought to kill him and which sought to destroy the kingdom of Israel, which he ruled over as king. We can read it all throughout his writings. One such place is in Psalm chapter 71, verse 1 through 3, where he writes, If you, in you, Lord, I have taken refuge. Let me never be put to shame. In your righteousness, rescue me and deliver me. Turn your ear to me and save me. Verse 3, be my rock of refuge to which I can always go. Give the command to save me, for you are my rock and my fortress. Hallelujah. Now, our need for rescue may look quite different than what Paul's did or what King David's did, though. I know mine did. Our need for a rescue came long before we were ever his children. Do we realize that? Think of a great big rescue effort in our mind. And, and the rescue effort that God needed to enlist on my behalf had nothing to do with being persecuted for preaching the gospel, I can assure you. Because there was a time when that is not what I was doing. And the rescue effort that God had to put in place was not because enemy armies in this physical land were trying to come after me like that of David. I instead needed rescued from the hold that the enemy of my soul had upon my life. And I also needed rescued from myself. And the things that may find us searching for rescue, they can be numerous, right? Addictions, people, destructive behaviors. I'm going to list just a few that popped in my head, okay? Okay. We might need rescued from porn or alcohol or depression 
or sex or heroin or homosexual desires, from rageful tendencies or malicious actions. We could go on and on and on listing all of the things that we could possibly think of that were maybe even a part of our lives before God came to rescue us from them. Amen? Amen. But the easiest way to sum all of it up is to say that what we needed rescued from was sin. And from the grip that the enemy had on our lives, which came through that sin. I heard another pastor describe it one way. That a Christian can't be possessed of the enemy, okay? A house can't have two masters. And so if you have Christ living inside of you, you can't be possessed of the enemy. But you can be oppressed from the outside by the enemy, right? And the way that he does that often is if you have what this pastor called handles on you. So let's think of a pot with handles on it, okay? And what is it that makes you have handles on you is wherever an area of your life is that is not fully surrendered to God. An area of your life that you have sin in. An area of your life that is like that closed room that we keep shut off to God like we talked about a couple of weeks ago and the enemy can grab hold and has something to hold onto us with right in John 10 10 Jesus tells us that the enemy comes to steal kill and destroy but that Christ has come that we may have life and have it more abundantly so those who are chained by the enemy okay whether in the form of addiction or any other type of sin are not living that abundant life that Jesus has made available to all of us. And Satan has them bound to something that will not or that will do nothing less than to steal from them and kill them and utterly destroy them and their families. That's his goal for all of us, right? And he uses every vice and every desire and every selfish motivation as powerful tools for accomplishing his work. But there is hope for each and every one of us who are or who have ever been in need of a rescue. And it's provided by Christ himself and the power of the cross. I want us to know that, okay? And it's available if we but reach out to him for the abundant life that he has planned for us. There is no chain that binds us that is too hard for him to break us free of. I want you to hear that there is no chain that binds us that is too strong for him to break us free of. What did the song say? Break every chain. Psalm chapter 107, starting in verse 10, skipping down through a few of them. One of my absolute favorite portions of scripture says, Some sat in darkness, in utter darkness, prisoners suffering in iron chains. Verse 13, Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them from their distress. He brought them out of darkness, the utter darkness, and broke away their chains. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love and his wonderful deeds for mankind. For he breaks down gates of bronze and cuts through bars of iron. Some became fools through their rebellious ways and suffered affliction because of their sins. They loathed all food. They drew drew close to the gates of death. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them from their distress. He sent out his word, and he healed them. He rescued them from the grave. Let us give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love, for his wonderful deeds for mankind. Someone say amen. addictions and habits and cycles of sin that we may at some point find ourselves in. Ones that try as we might, we just can't seem to shake. 
They can feel like prisons where you're actually chained to the very thing that you want freedom from. You may even hate the thing that you're doing. Much like what Paul describes in Romans chapter 7, verse 18 and 19. He says, for I know that good itself does not dwell in me. That is, in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do. This I keep doing. And I'm going, Paul, you're my dude. I can so relate to that. Not right now at this moment in my life. Thank you, Jesus. But guess what? There was a time in my life where the very thing that I hated, the very thing that I wanted ripped from me, was the very thing that I was imprisoned to. I had the desire to do what was good, but I didn't do it. And the thing I didn't want to do, that's the thing I did. And it's a vicious cycle. But I'm here to tell you that despite the fact that you may feel like you are in a prison with no way out, that is simply not true. We have a promise from God that he can cut through the very bars of iron that seem so strong and powerful in your life. This passage from Psalm 107 tells us that if we cry out to the Lord in our time of trouble, then he will come and he will rescue us out of that place of distress simply because he loves us. Not because we deserve it. What did it say? They were in that position because of the evil that was in their lives. But all they had to do was cry out to them, cry out to him. He didn't make them earn it. He didn't make them try to straighten up on their own first. He just looked on them with love and said, finally, ask me for my help. Now I can help you. Hmm. The scripture also reminds us that we don't need to get cleaned up before we come to God, right? Right. We can be at the very lowest point in our lives. At a place where we have tried hundreds of times to get free from on our own and have failed every single time, and all we have to do is cry out to him. There was a time in my life, and I've spoken of this before, you know, these can be times in your life where you're still in church on Sunday morning, okay? This doesn't even necessarily mean that you're way out here in the world somewhere. This means you get all cleaned up, looking like you're Jesus' best on Sunday. And you can still have these things in you. And there was a time where I was in the fetal position on my bedroom floor. And I'm crying out to God and I'm saying, please rip this from me. I don't want this in there anymore, but I can't do this on my own. And I've tried to save face and I've tried to stay dressed up and I've tried to show up all the time. And I've tried to fool everybody else, but this is killing me. Rip it out of me. And guess what? That's when he did it. He didn't do it when I was trying to do it all on my own. And I was looking like Susie Sunday School. No offense, Susie. (laughs) (laughs) He did it when I cried out for help. Just as David did, rescue me and deliver me. Turn your ear to me and save me. Be my rock of refuge. And in the very nature of his faithfulness, because that's what God is, he will come in with his strength and he will break your every chain. Amen. Yeah. He's able to open the door of any prison you find yourself in. He's able to free you to walk in the plans and the purposes he has for you. So that was our first section of rescued. Next, we're going to come to ransomed. Remember, rescued, ransomed, and redeemed. Hallelujah. So ransomed. We might hear that God will rescue us, and we might think that suffices in everything then, everything we would ever need. All he has to do is rescue us. That's, that's enough in itself, but it's actually not, okay? 
And in most of those cases that we listed, all those things that had come to my mind, okay, we needed rescued from something that had us bound, right? We needed chains broken from us. And while many of us have been made witness to his rescuing ability in our lives, that's not all Jesus came for. He didn't just come to rescue us over and over and over again every time we cry out to help for, from him. He didn't come to the earth and live a sinless life and take the sins of the world upon himself and be beaten and scourged and die a gruesome death and conquer death, hell, and the grave and be resurrected and, and just so that he could rescue us every time that we're in trouble. He actually did all of that to redeem us. Okay? And before we accept Jesus as our Savior, our lives no matter what appearance they may have from the outside, they belong to the kingdom of darkness. If we have not surrendered our life to Christ, then we belong to the kingdom of darkness. It might sound like a harsh statement. It's very black and white. It's absolute truth, okay? Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1 through 3. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. Verse 3, all of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were, by nature, deserving of wrath. Wait, this is the New Testament, and it's telling us that when we don't live for Christ, we're deserving of wrath. What? And that small set of scriptures describes in full truth and in clarity exactly what we were, exactly whose we were, and exactly what we were deserving of before we came to Christ. It's so simple. We belong to the kingdom we follow. There are only two kingdoms. You have to follow one of them, and you belong to the one that you follow. And because, what did it say there? We followed the ruler of the kingdom of the air, then that means that we belong to that kingdom, the kingdom in which we followed, right? And because we belong to that kingdom, the kingdom of darkness, then we needed brought back, bought back, sorry, we needed bought back to the one who we're supposed to belong to, right? So let's think of it as this. We were captives of the enemy. We were hostages to both the sin that was in our body and to the death of our souls, right? Think of a hostage, and because we were hostages, then what? A ransom needed paid for us in order for us to go free, right? Mark chapter 10, verse 45. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. There was a price put on us, a price put on your head, and that price needed paid. And there was only one who could pay it on our behalf, and that was Jesus. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 20, out of the Amplified, says, You were bought with a price. It says you were actually purchased with the precious blood of Jesus and made his own. So then, honor and glorify God with your body. Having been ransomed from the enemy that once held us captive, okay, we now fit the description of Ephesians 5, 8. It says, for you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Therefore, live as children of the light. Hallelujah. <laughs> like, it's so simple, right? People make the word of God so hard. People try to make you think that oh, you need special divine revelation from God to even understand the scriptures. That is simple. You can only have one master. You are following either the master of the kingdom of darkness or the master of the kingdom of light. 
you need ransomed from that kingdom of darkness. There was only one who was worthy of paying that price or that ransom that was on your head. That was Jesus, and he did it for you. It's that easy. And once you accept that, and once you accept his free gift that he's offering you, then live as children of light. Hmm. So we've been rescued, and we've been ransomed, and now we're going into our last one. Are you guys still with me? I had lots and lots of pages, so I'm trying to talk fast so it doesn't take forever. (laughs) But I feel like I need to take a breath. Okay. (laughs) All right. And our last one is redeemed, right? Now, this is super cool. To fully help us grasp this redeemed one, I thought, I'm going to look up the definition of redeemed. And I'm so glad I did because it was really good. Like, we know what redeemed means, you know? But sometimes to just hear, like, okay, what are the actual words that they put with this word to make it sound or to make it have the most impact, right? So the definition for the word redeemed, one is to compensate for the faults of. Hmm. How many of us had faults (laughs) that needed compensated for? (laughs) But number two, to gain or regain possession of. Hmm. Redeemed, to gain or regain possession of. And then it goes on further. It says, in exchange for payment. Wow. Redeemed. To gain or regain possession of in exchange for payment. What was that payment? The ransom that was just paid. Jesus' blood, his very life poured out for us, right? Yeah, that's good. Somebody say that's good. good. Yeah. To gain or regain possession of in exchange for payment. Now here's some synonyms of the word redeemed. Vindicate. Yeah. That's one of those. Yeah. Yeah, The other one, justify. Oh, yeah. Just as if I never sinned. Not justify as in, I used to say I could justify anything. (laughs) Any wrong in my life, I could talk in circles all the way around it until in my head, I just justified every action I ever did. That is not the true meaning of justify here. In being a synonym of redeemed, okay? Another synonym, recover. Hmm. And the last one, get this. Save. To save. Hallelujah. To gain or regain possession of in exchange for a payment. To vindicate, justify, recover. To save. We have been redeemed. We have been saved. Hallelujah. First Peter chapter 1, verse 18 through 22, Peter writes, For you know that it was not with perishable things, such as silver or gold, that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors. Have any of us ever lived an empty way of life? Verse 19, But with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect, Verse 20, he was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Through him, you believe in God, who raised him from the dead and glorified him, and so your faith and hope are in God. Yeah, he redeemed us. Isaiah chapter 44, verse 22 I'm going to read it out of the NIV and the New King James Version because I could not decide which one I liked better. So I'll let you guys pick. Isaiah 44, 22. In the NIV, he says, I have swept away your offenses like a cloud. Your sins like the morning mist. Return to me, for I have redeemed you. Now, what was that word redeemed? To gain or regain possession of. How many of us have knelt at the altar of salvation more than one time in our life? Yeah. He gained possession of me, and then he had to regain possession of me. What did this say? I swept your offenses away like a cloud, and your sin like the morning mist. Return to me. I have redeemed you. In the New King James Version, he he says it this way. He says, 
I have blotted out like a thick cloud your transgressions and like a cloud your sins. Return to me for I have redeemed you. Now I want us to grasp this last section tonight before we come to a close. We're still in the redeemed segment here, okay? But there's two things that I want us to get here is that we are both redeemed from and redeemed to, okay? So we have been redeemed from the enemy, right? Such as we looked at with the ransom being paid for us, right? That was redeeming us from the enemy that we were hostages of, okay? We have been redeemed from the sin that stained our lives, right? That, that kept us from relationship and kept us from right standing with him. We've been redeemed from that. We've been redeemed from the guilt and the shame that was associated with those sins, right? Because we can be saved and we can be redeemed and we can have all of that paid for, but if the enemy can keep us stuck in the guilt and the shame for the things that we did, and we never advance in anything for the kingdom, then it's like he still won, yeah. right? And so we have to ask ourselves, what good is it being rescued, and what good is it being ransomed if we still live bound after that? That doesn't even make any sense, right? Bound by the memories and bound by the reminders and and bound by the shame of where our lives once resided. Now, there's a musical artist called Big Daddy Weave, and they reference this in one of my favorite songs of theirs, which is appropriately titled Redeemed. Um, and as most of you know, I love music, right? Or I love to worship, I should say. And although nothing, nothing, nothing replaces the word of God, Okay, so like there's never a song lyric that replaces the word of God. I hope we understand that, okay? But I do believe that worship music can have a very large part in our lives as Christians, okay? It can play an important role in our lives. It can impact us greatly, okay? It's not a substitution for the word, all right? We still need to be in the word. We still need to be studying the word. But we can also glean things from what God has downloaded into different music groups, right? So when we think of that statement that I said a moment ago, like what good would it be to be rescued and ransomed and still live bound, okay, bound by memories, bound by reminders, okay? Maybe those reminders come from the enemy. Maybe those reminders come from someone used by the enemy to remind you of those things, okay? Or bound by the shame of where our lives once resided, and I'm going to tell you that a long time after the fact of God answering my cry when I'm in the fetal position on my bedroom floor, crying out to him, rip this out of me, okay? For a long time after that, I still lived bound. Not bound by that thing that I asked him to remove. He removed that. He was so faithful to do that and to answer that prayer. But then I lived bound in a whole different way in the shame and the guilt that was attached to what it was that he redeemed me from. Now, when he redeems us and rescues us, okay, he does it to the full. He was not the one shaming me or guilting me or saying, how could you have done that? No. Listen to these lyrics. Seems like all I can see was the struggle. Haunted by ghosts that lived in my past, bound up in shackles of all my failure, wondering how long is this going to last. Then you look at this prisoner and say to me, son, stop fighting a fight that's already been won. And they say, I am redeemed, you set me free, so I'll shake off those heavy chains and wipe away every stain because I'm not who I used to be. I am redeemed. Amen. Yes. 
verse 2 says, All my life I've been called unworthy, named by the voice of my shame and regret. Do you know that? Our shame and regret has a voice, right? And sometimes it's very loud. But then I hear you whisper, child, lift up your head. And I remember, oh God, you're not done with me yet. Because I don't have to be the old man inside of me because his day is long dead and gone. Because I've got a new name and a new life and I'm not the same. And a hope that will carry me home. Amen. Amen. So we are redeemed from. We're redeemed from sin. And we're redeemed from the shame and the guilt and the memories of those sins. Okay? But it doesn't even stop there. We're redeemed to something. And we're redeemed to a life in Jesus and we're redeemed to a calling that he has placed on us. And we're redeemed to the equipping that he will give to go along with that calling so that we can fulfill that calling. And we are redeemed to the power that now resides within us. No longer a power to um, influence us to sin, but instead the power of the Holy Spirit that now resides within us and flows out of us, redeemed to the authority that he's given to us by telling us that we can use his name to combat the enemy and redeemed to the external existence that we, we now live out or will live out once our time on this earth is done. Amen? Rescued, <laughs> ransomed, and redeemed. If Mercy Music would like to come to the front, we're going to close in prayer. And I'm going to close us out in just a general prayer this evening. But if there is anyone who would like specific prayer, um, maybe you've not been rescued yet. Maybe you're ready to call out to him and ask for that. Or, or maybe you feel like that hostage to the enemy.